Thank you very much for that presentation. Mark, I now invite Malini Maraj to the podium. Afternoon all. In yesterday's opening session, Dr. Alain thoroughly detailed the economic status of the Caribbean region, highlighting, among others, the region's growth rates, per capita incomes, debt to GDP ratios, and he distinguished it for service um, and good producers. This overview demonstrated that even with somewhat favorable economic growth rates, the region faces a myriad of economic challenges. When you look around you, however, you do not see growth rates. You do not see inflation rates or debt crises. What you see are the effects of these economic challenges on people. You see crime, you see poverty, you see hunger, you see unemployment, you see unhappiness. Or as Amartya Sen describes, you see unfreedoms. For this reason, it is important for us to be careful with what we concern ourselves about, whether it's going to be the economic growth or whether it's going to be poverty. While economic growth and GDP, for some reason, remains an obsession and a priority, the real issues are not necessarily what happens to GDP or inflation rates, but more so how the conditions under which people live are affected. And I borrow from, from the work of Sir Arthur Lewis. This recognition of the divergence between economic growth and economic development led to the creation of alternative indices of development, among which the Human Development Index has gained significant credence. More recently, a Social Progress Index has surfaced, um, also uh, purporting to convey a message of progress. This presentation raises some issues related to the use of such indicators in the Caribbean context, bearing in mind that we have to ensure that these indicators, like GDP, do not distract from the state of development on the ground and the Caribbean reality. So the presentation, therefore, reviews these two indicators as it relates to a reflection of the Caribbean reality and suggests that, given the importance of such indicators to decision-making, that care be taken when buying into shiny new indicators and even relying on the older, well-established ones. Dudley says, in the meaning of development, asserted that development was about, is about the realization of the human personality. And this is measured by, reflected by, reductions in unemployment, inequality, and poverty. And he stated quite clearly that even as income increases, if any of these, if any one of these, and certainly if more than one of these have become worse, that is, it is difficult to suggest that development has occurred. The Human Development Report in 1990 recognized that development is much more than just an expansion of income and wealth, and defined human development as the process of enlarging people's choices, and follows very closely the work of Amartya Sen in terms of entitlements and capabilities. The recognition of the unidimensional nature of GDP provided an impetus for the Human Development Index to establish the concept of human development within the intellectual discourse. Now, earlier in today's conference, I think uh, Mr. Dunton would have presented on the Human Development Index in terms of what it demonstrates and what it is based on, particularly the dimensions and the indicators that are used to derive it. But I want you to take a look at the information here, and, and this basically tell, gives you the message of the Human Development Index. Uh, the Human Development Index ranges between zero and one. So in terms of the HDI score, values that tend towards one are indicative of higher levels of human development, and values closer to zero are indicative of lower levels of human development. And Based on the HDI scores, the Human Development Report ranks uh, some 184 countries based on these scores. So what you see in front of you are, are comparisons between the 2012 rank and the 2013 rank and the 2012 HDI scores and the 2013 HDI scores. And uh, I'm a teacher at heart, you know, so based on that information, you know, I dare ask you, so what message do you get from this table in front of you? Certainly, if you look at the 2012 ranks, 
It might be surprising to some that Grenada, Antigua and Barbuda Trinidad, um, outrank Trinidad and Tobago in terms of human development. You know, I know in, in my class there was a gasp when I, when I told them, this, out of all of the Caribbean countries, which do you think are more developed according to the Human Development Index? And Trinidad and Tobago tends to be the first one that they would identify. And I would say, no, 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 it's not. And then they would call, okay, maybe Barbie, Barbados, yes. But when you get to the point of identifying Grenada, and Antigua and Barbuda is more developed according to the HDI, you know, there's some degree of disbelief. And even comparatively between the 2012 and 2013 human development indices, there's a lot of questions that arise as well. We see that there, there's a significant change in the human development rank of Barbados moving from 38 to 59 and a change associated with, the ch with a, a, a difference in its human development index from 0 0.825 to 0 0.776. And we have to ask ourselves then uh, what attributes, what can be attributed to, to, to this change? You know, what has happened in Barbados so significantly between 2012 and 2013 to cause such a significant change in its human development rank and score? So again, there is a message behind these indicators and, and, and how we interpret the indicators. And I just thought a, a key point and something that might also raise a, a lot of eyebrows is the fact that St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the 2013, well, in the 2013 Human Development Index produced um, in the 2014 Human Development Report ranks and scores the same as China. Right? And, and that's something quite interesting. China and St. Vincent and the Grenadines have, in the 2014 Human Development Report, the same score, the same Human Development Index, and the same Human Development Rank. And I mean, that by itself uh, raises a lot of questions in terms of the merit of the index itself and, and the degree to which it reflects, again, the Caribbean reality. Are you saying then that outside of our, uh, it's outside, you look outside, are you saying that we are the same? In terms of China, are you saying that when you look outside, everything matches what happens or what is happening in China? And then you have the Social Progress Index, which, like the Human Development Index, was built with the intention to broaden, uh, more and, and to sorry, to broaden and include a more inclusive model of development, um, recognizing that new metrics would uh, assist in evaluating progress. It moves beyond GDP and it emphasizes on social and environmental performance. It is stated that the index measures social progress and social progress is defined here um, directly independent of economic development. So it actually treats social progress as independent of economic development. It is derived from 54 indicators of social and environmental outcome and ranks among 132 countries uh, 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 the, according to the scores. And in the Caribbean region, the information produced out of the Social Progress Index just for this year, because this is when it emerged, of a Jamaica, Trinidad, and Tobago, and Guyana. And again, there are certain questions there I can, I can ask you in terms of your observations. Um, Jamaica outranks Trinidad and Tobago according to the Social Progress Index. So it, it suggests then that Jamaica does better or, or performs better in terms of social progress. Um, and similarly, uh, outranking Guyana as well. So the top performers outside of the information in front of you are New Zealand, Switzerland, Iceland, and I know everybody interested in what, what the U.S. looks like. So the U.S. ranks 16th. And in terms of an interpretation as well, we need to identify what message comes out of it. So following the publication of the SPI, uh, headlines in the Express were that the index ranks Trinidad and Tobago poorly in social progress, outlining that the country, Trinidad and Tobago, scored strongly on tolerance and inclusion, ranking 22nd globally, but scores poorly on personal safety and ecosystem sustainability. So it's not to say that there isn't some merit in the message, but comparatively as well, we have to question how does it uh, relate to other countries in the, region, in the region and how does it reflect the issues of uh, the Caribbean economy. It has been stated that any attempt to understand the state of the world 
which is what HDI purports to do, is only as good as its ability to reflect the realities of the world. Can one tell, therefore, from both tables for the HDI and the SPI, whether the image of the Caribbean is presented and whether this fits with what we actually see around us? The Human Development Report in 1990 stressed that, in principle, the choices available to people can be infinite and it can change over time. And this statement acknowledges that development priorities are not static. The UNDP has attempted to modify the methodology of the um, Human Development Index and, and in 2010, uh, produced an inequality adjusted human development index as well, which, whilst capturing another developmental dimension of inequality, still assumes that all dimensions are equally significant to development in all countries, as does the SPI too, in terms of its methodology. Particularly in the Caribbean, the issue of economic growth, and I'm just using this as an example, the issue of economic growth or health, for example, is not the same for Trinidad and Tobago to say as, as it is in Haiti. So beyond methodological shortcomings, we cannot assume that the dimensions captured by the HDI or the SPI demonstrate key Caribbean concerns. And Pantin and Arts in 2009 identified peculiar challenges characteristic of, of the Caribbean region. Uh, including stubborn unemployment and underemployment, particularly among youths and, and, and a population that has contributed to crime, etc. Also, and I think it's very important, vulnerability to natural disasters exacerbated by climate change. And based on an identif uh, 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 identification of these key uh, Caribbean challenges and Caribbean needs, therefore, we need to ask ourselves to what extent do these uh, indices, the, the Human Development Index, and, let me just go back quickly, and the Social Progress Index, reflect this reality? Do we see that coming out of these indices? And I'm not, I'll state this before the question comes up, I'm not uh, saying that there is no merit in the indices, of course, I'm just saying that we, we need to be careful in terms of our interpretation and use of these indicators of development as, as ways of basing decisions. You know, you look at the Human Development Index and, and if the score approaches, you think that all is well, so you shift focus on something else when at the, at the end of the day, it, it may not be so, all right? So we have to consider the nature of how these indices have been developed. We have to consider the priorities under which they were developed. And uh, quoting uh, CS, who quotes E.H. Carr, who identifies, by H., who identifies Carr in the, in the statement, before you study economics, study the economists. Before you study the economists, study his, his historical, historical and social environment. It calls for, for a typology, typology of economic, economic systems, systems and, and, and specific ways in which we can, can treat with, with uh, our, our inherent, inherent characteristics in the Caribbean. In the Caribbean and acknowledge that not all policies, as well as indicators, are specific to our needs and can necessarily solve our problems. And some recommendations, I'm not going to go into detail, might be looking at um, the Social Vulnerability Index produced by Dr. Godfrey St. Bernard for the Caribbean region as one possible index that will convey that um, message and that can be looked at as a perhaps a better, a better reflection, reflection of the Caribbean, Caribbean reality. And internationally, internationally as well, we see that it has been recognized that other indices must be developed to, ex to express the realities of the countries. countries. And there is a Canadian index of well-being that does not apply to every economy in the world, but it is specific to Canada. So in, in the same manner, we need to look at uh, how we rely on indi indicators, indicators to determine our policies. Uh, we, uh, we have to be careful that, that our policy domains are not solely dictated by internationally determined priorities and measures, but also reflect the inherent characteristics of the Caribbean and that they aid in addressing our needs in the Caribbean. Thank you.
Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to speak to you this afternoon about public procurement and the economy, and specifically so the economy of CARICOM. And I think it is most fitting that I'm doing so in this, in this forum. This is a conference on the economy. And a common theme that has run through several of the presentations that I have sat in between yesterday and, and today is regionalism and regional integration. And so I want to stimulate your, your thought process and to get a conversation going about this value that we have in public procurement. Now, when we speak about public procurement, what are we speaking about? And public procurement simply is the process by which public entities acquire goods, services, all kinds, construction works, using public funds to serve ultimately a public purpose. So we're focusing on the Caribbean community. And CARICOM was established, as most people know, by the Treaty of Chagaramas right here in Trinidad. It comprises 15 states spread out across the geographic area of the Caribbean, has a total population of approximately 17 million. And these CARICOM single market and economy, which, which evolved later on in, in, the, in the, the CARICOM discourse, came into effect in 2001 and was intended to, to deepen the integration process, provide a, a, a space for greater collaboration across the region among governments and business interests, and to, to put the, the region in a better position to, to compete in the global landscape. The CSME, the revised treaty that brought the CSME into being as part of that undertaking, it mandates the member states to elaborate a regional procurement protocol. And we think that this, is, this did not happen by accident that the heads of government took, uh, took this decision. It was around the time when the region itself was involved in a number of um, trade negotiation processes, for example, the free trade area of the Americas. And it was intended to, to provide the, the avenue for the region to, to sort of work out its own internal arrangements and then use that platform to negotiate with others. That has not um, materialized. Um, it also came at a time when, of course, Procurement was featuring significantly in these trade agreements, and the multilateral lenders were taking an, an increased interest in national procurement systems. So we mentioned the population size of the region, and one of the things that came out in, in earlier presentations was you know, this, this feature of, of small developing states. The population size is small. So we have a collective um, population of about 17 million. And so this is the, the market. What does this market really, really represent? What does it mean? Well, in procurement terms, it means that there are 17 million persons across the region that the governments need to deliver public, public services and goods to. Um, infrastructure, health care, education, the whole works. At the same time, there are 17 million consumers of, of, of products. So it provides an opportunity for private business to supply the demand on both sides. So the government has this huge, this enormous purchaser, and at the same time, to the individual consumers. It is often dismissed as a small market, but what we are arguing is that it is, it is quite substantial and it is not insignificant. Um, it compares to um, some of the strong e economies that we like to match ourselves up against, like Singapore with a population of 5 million, for example. What is the current state of public procurement in the region in terms of governance? Well, at donor instigation over the last 10 years or so, 
practically all the countries have engaged in some kind of modernization or reform of their procurement system. But of course, because it was donor instigated, it wasn't homegrown and, and, you know, and home driven. So wherever the donor funding or intervention would, would relent, then the reform would come to a, a standstill. Right here in Trinidad and Tobago, this country is also going through some reform, having brought a new piece of legislation to parliament to, to modernize the legal framework for public procurement, and we hope that that will make its way through the parliamentary process. The regional CSME protocol, procurement protocol, has not yet been realized. A, a policy framework was signed off on a few years ago, and not much more progress has been made since then. The procurement systems are weak in terms of um, showing the features of, of good practice, and only one country actually demonstrates some features of a strong procurement system. There is very little by way of economic cooperation taking place on the procurement front. And we lack, as a region, and even at a country level, a strategic vision for this value of public procurement. It also lacks leadership and, and, and a champion to drive and modernize the procurement systems of the region. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on debt. This has been said um, over the, the past two days, except to say that debt poses a, a huge challenge to public procurement because it constrains the spending power of the governments and, of course, their ability to deliver to their various publics the well-needed um, social and other public services. So I spoke about this, the governance, the state of governance um, of the, you know, the, the procurement framework across the Caribbean. And this very colorful uh, matrix is to send one message to you. Um, green is good, red is bad. And so using the, the, the indicators established by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they have what is known as a MAPS, Methodology for Assessment of Procurement Systems. So using the various indicators of that instrument, like this, the, the legal regulatory framework, whether there's a complaints mechanism, mechanism, whether there are standard bidding documents, whether there's audit and accountability, and so on, all these key features, we mapped, we assessed, we developed our own scale for this paper, and we assessed and mapped um, all these countries within CARICOM. And you'll see that Jamaica, which is the, the largely green um, bar going, going down, Jamaica is the only country that demonstrates um, some, some, some degree of progress. In, as matched up against these indicators, it shows the, the most presence of these various features of good practice in a national procurement system. Now, what is the value? Let's get to the crux of it now. What is the value of this procurement market? Now, using the general benchmark of the multilateral agencies, they've tended to estimate procurement at around 15 to 20% of GDP. And so what we did for the purpose of this analysis is to arrive at the regional GDP figure, and these figures we took from the IMF World Economic Outlook, and we've estimated procurement using that 20% benchmark at 15 billion, or around 15.5 billion across the region. That's the value of public procurement. It is a very modest estimate, I must caution, because we know, we have seen, in spite of the lack of um, statistical systems that capture public procurement data, based on what we've seen, we know that given the level of government activity in the economies, procurement has tended to be a lot higher, 30% and sometimes more. And it spikes every year in response to, to catastrophic events like hur hurricanes and floods. I see I'm fast running out of time. Um, so the 15 0.5 billion market is distributed in this way. The largest procurers are, you know, the big, the big three, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, 
with the Bahamas um, close behind and Haiti because there is a lot of reconstruction work going on in Haiti. What we're saying though, the message is that this market is much bigger than we assume it to be. It has been dismissed many times. Caribbean is too small, the land space is small, they don't have enough people. It, they, we have substantial value and we need to harness it. It is 57% of the amount spent by the World Bank in over 160 countries in 2013. I'm, I work with the IDB. It is larger than the total value of projects approved by the IDB in the entire Latin America and Caribbean region in 2012, which, which was worth 11.4 billion. It compares to the GDP of several countries. So we have this value, but it is imprisoned in a segregated market being managed under very, very poor conditions. The IDB is the largest multilateral lender within the region, and our portfolio amounts to, I just threw this in for good measure, approximately 3.2 billion. And you will see that not all the CARICOM states are members of the IDB, so we don't lend to all of them. But what I want you to see from this graph, the IDB portion is in blue, but you will see that the, the lion's share of procurement is being funded largely by the governments themselves. Right? And so, what you need to understand is that more of the, <laughs> the taxpayers' dollars, more of it is at risk. Because when you have donor funding, the donor brings certain strictures, right? So if the country system is weak, the donor is going to insist on the use of its own procedures to ensure transparency, accountability, procurement has to produce certain results. When the country procurement system is weak, and the government is funding its own procurement, these things don't apply. So there's more room for mismanagement, more room for corruption. I want to feature the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, a subgroup, a microcosm within CARICOM, but they have been able to achieve what the wider CARICOM has not. Since 1986, the, the, these nine states established the Pharmaceutical Procurement Service. Within three years, it was self-sufficient. It could finance itself. And they have been able to see, to, to see savings of over 30% on their annual purchasing of pharmaceuticals. How? By pooling. Pooling. And, and the, the, the framework that they have in the OECS, which, as I said, is a microcosm of what we have in CARICOM, has facilitated this. And I'm asking for, I see the two minutes, I'm asking for a little indulgence, please. They have a, a, a regional central bank. They have a common currency. And so the pooling and the purchasing of the pharmaceuticals, it is channeled through the central bank. That's where the account is held. But look at what they have been able to achieve. And we are saying if this model could be even applied or if the rest of CARICOM could join in, because the rest of us are, we are all purchasing our pharmaceuticals, you know, in our own insular individual way, and we are not benefiting from this machinery that could save us so much money. And what could we do if we were able to save 20% on 15 billion, which is a modest estimate, look at how much we could save. Over 3.75 billion we could save. And what would that mean for the delivery of more public services? What would that mean for debt reduction? So the conclusion is that small size does not at all indicate small value. It does not necessarily mean vulnerability. The OECS is an example. They sought to overcome the vulnerability of, of size by amalgamating their procurement in order to make it um, more cost effective. So going forward, we didn't want to outline all the problems, and, and the presentation has been severely truncated, of course, but we didn't want to out outline all the problems without you know, recommending some solutions. And we are saying that the CARICOM framework that we have, the existing obligations, provides everything that we need in order to harness this procurement value, in order to, to cooperate among ourselves so that we can, we can benefit and develop together. It, it provides for the free movement of capital. It provides for the free movement of persons and, and, and labor and goods and services. 
all of which are integral elements in public procurement activities. And the 12 pillars, I call them, of the policy that was approved in 2011 contains all the ingredients that are necessary to transform public procurement in the region. And I'll give one example. There is a severe shortage, even in you know, a very developed economy like Trinidad and Tobago, there's a severe shortage of personnel for procurement. We have a treaty that facilitates the free movement of persons. If we could be training people in an institution such as we're standing here in here, if we could be training people, um, professionalizing them, certifying them in, in public procurement, they would be able to move across the region, assuming at that it would be facilitated, and they would be able to take up positions that are available across the countries in public procurement. There is a serious shortage. So the time is now, and we are putting this out there and putting it on the table as a call to action. And I want to highlight just two very important roles. I, I mentioned one just now for the University of the West Indies. One is in training and capacity building, and the other is in providing an observatory, um, collaborating with civil, civil society to do research and, and, and you know, to, to look into the public procurement systems and to keep, to keep the systems honest. There is a, a very important role for the UWI as the premier institution in the region to play in that regard. And I want to close in the year of the World Cup, the beautiful game, with this image. And what I'm saying is that this is the united front that we need to be presenting as CARICOM to the rest of the world. And I don't believe, in honor of Professor Pantin, who is a son of Trinidad and Tobago and a Caribbean scholar and somebody who espoused regionalism, I don't believe that the opportunity for integration is entirely lost. Thank you.